Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Reach the World's incredible and exciting live stream series for the Endurance 22 expedition. My name is Chris Ahern. I am Director of Partnerships here at Reach the World, and I am so excited to speak with you all again today. Uh, I had a, a wonderful time last week speaking with our friends at the Royal Geographical Society uh, across the Atlantic Ocean in, in Great Britain. And I'm so excited to, to connect again, instead of going across the Atlantic eastward from here in New York City, we're going a little westward to connect with, with my friend and colleague, Tim Jacob, who is not in the Weddell Sea. He is in Chicago um, at his home office and excited to share uh, some of the experiences that he had with his friends, colleagues, uh, shipmates aboard the SA Agullis II uh, when he was on the Endurance 22 expedition just a few weeks ago. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking about a lot of exciting animals, things that I, I know I haven't seen outside of maybe an aquarium or zoo, and in some cases not even there. And, and we also have some amazing classrooms that are joining us that will be asking questions and sharing some, maybe some of their observations and things as we go. So um, just a very quick welcome to our friends in Connecticut, in St. Louis, and in Brooklyn, who will be joining us live in just a few moments. Uh, but also, for those of you who are joining us live on YouTube, please tell us where you're joining from the chat and and um, and and anything else you care to share about, about why you're joining us today. I see our friends from Brazil are here again. Welcome. And uh, as well as some, some amazing... Uh, I see Tom is here from Austin, Texas. I'm sure we have plenty of other voices. So we can't wait to, to welcome you along this journey. So with that, Tim, I, uh, I want to bring you on so we can talk a little bit about animals. Hey, Chris. Thanks for the, the great uh, introduction. It's nice to see you all, explorers. Welcome back to Reach the World. Um, one of my the great things that I've been doing since I got back from the Weddell Sea is going through the thousands of pictures and videos that I brought back with me as my main souvenir of this experience. And the, the theme that I really sort of discovered is a major theme is all of the amazing wildlife that we saw as part of this expedition. This was my first trip to the Antarctic. Uh, I am not a biologist. I, I don't actually know very much about a deep dive into animals, but because this was my first trip to the Antarctic, uh, I got to sort of approach this experience and the wildlife that I saw and the expedition saw along the way with some fresh eyes and a fresh level of excitement. So without any further ado, I really want to dive into what I saw as part of this expedition, and I can't wait to hear your questions. It's highly possible that some people in this audience might know even more about some of these animals than I do, and I'm excited to talk about them, uh, answer some of your questions, and what I'm going to focus on today are the things that, that I saw and experienced over the course of this expedition, which was quite a lot um, in retrospect. Uh, so let's dive right into it. I have some, some photos, and I want to start with something that I saw almost immediately as soon as we left Cape Town. Uh, as soon as we got away from Cape Town uh, and into the Southern Atlantic Ocean, uh, we started seeing these like puffs of something rising up from the water all around us. And I gave you a little hint about what it is by saying, there she blows. Um, I think many of you can probably guess what this spout indicates, what animal might be just beneath the surface uh, in this picture. And let's jump ahead to the next slide because you get a little bit better view of what it was that was making that about, you can see just a little bit arched back there of a fin whale. Uh, I was so excited. I didn't really actually know how many whales I would see. I was hoping to see a lot of whales. But as, like I said, as soon as we left Cape Town, we started seeing whales right away uh, in this section of the South Atlantic that really not a lot of ships go through. It's, it's kind of a quiet area of the, uh, of the South Atlantic. So I was delighted to see this fin whale. Fin whales are the second largest whale in the world behind blue whales. Um, and it's hard to tell because most of the whale is underwater in this picture. I only ever got glimpses of their backs as they surfaced. And you can see way in the back, and I think on the next picture too, the little, little itty bitty fin towards the back uh, of the whale. 
that uh, is one of the clues that that is a fin whale. These fin whales can get up to 60 feet long, which I thought was amazing. It's so big and weigh up to 100,000 pounds, which is a really, really big whale. And in the same waters, um, but not I was not able to document it as well, we saw humpback whales. Um, whenever on the ship, somebody spotted a whale. Uh, I remember uh, we were eating dinner one night and there were little portholes on the side of the ship and someone said, whale! And everybody ran to the, the portholes to see if they could uh, spot the whale as we were going by. So this is a fin whale. Um, also saw humpback whales. And as we got closer to the Weddell Sea, um, some of the, the creatures that we saw um, changed a little bit. So let's go to the next slide, please. So as we were getting closer to the, the sub-Antarctic and the Antarctic, we started seeing more birds. And remember, we were in like really, really wide open ocean. There was not any land around us uh, at the point where I took this picture. This picture is kind of backlit, so you can't see the color or the detail on the bird that was flying alongside the, uh, the ship. But I asked several members of, of the expedition who knew more about birds than I did. Then they said, this is an albatross or a petrel. And I got very excited because I was on the lookout for an albatross. Albatross are some of the biggest birds uh, in the whole world. Uh, they have massive wingspans. Their wings can span, get up to like 10 feet wide from tip to tip. Um, and they're very, very good flyers. Whenever uh, I went out on the deck of the SA Gulls too, and if I saw a bird, it was probably sort of riding on one side of the ship uh, it was pretty windy and they didn't look like they were trying too hard uh, to stay in the air. They were very graceful. Um, they were really using the wind to their advantage and um, just very, very efficient flyers. And I have to be honest, there are a lot of people in the world who are really into birds and um, were especially on the expedition who really like like to spot birds. Um, I don't know a lot about birds. I focus more on the bigger animals that we saw but I was very excited to see this albatross uh, or petrel. We saw some other birds along the way, but I'm gonna focus mostly today uh, on some of the more um, land-based animals that we saw <laughs> along the way. Tim, Tim, I just wanted to add one, one quick fun fact about this, that um, albatross and petrel are, are um, they're not that they're they're not that far off in terms of the the different different groups of birds that are out there, and they're both a part of a um, a group of birds known as tube noses. And so they have they have if you ever if you ever look up a picture online of albatross or petrel, they kind of have these uh, these these big kind of nostrils that um, that you can tell, and that's partially because they they need to be able to clear the salt from from their um, from their lungs and things as they're flying, and they are. They they fly some of the longest distances of any bird. So they'll they'll be in they'll be in the Antarctic region um, one part of the year, and they'll actually go all the way up. In some cases, all the way up to the Arctic. Uh, and I think that's just yeah. such an amazing example. Whether that's an isle albatross or a petrel, these are birds that that they're big travelers, just like you are, Tim. Absolutely, yeah. And I hope um, you get a chance to read the traditions field note that I wrote about albatross because. I love the fact that seeing an albatross uh, during a big open ocean journey uh, can be a sign to sailors of good luck. And so seeing this bird, I interpret it as good luck. And as we know, we went on to find endurance. So maybe this, this bird was the first sign in retrospect that uh, we were destined to find the ship. Um, excellent. So. After we, I saw some whales and I saw um, this albatross or petrel. Um, if we move on to the next picture, I'll show you a picture. This is more or less what the, the frozen sea ice surface of the Weddell Sea looked like when we arrived. And as you can see, there's no trees, there's no bushes, there's no plants. Uh, it is a very barren environment. And if you didn't know much about the Weddell Sea, like I did not know a lot about it going in, you might think, wow, like nothing can survive here. This is kind of a barren desert, um, but I could not have been more wrong. And let's move on to the next slide because I wanna really get into some of the things we saw. The first thing uh, that I saw that I was so excited about were these Adelie penguins. And Adelie penguins uh, tended to sort of 
live or, or collect around these raised ridges in the ice. You can see a bunch of Adelie penguins here um, that were um, just kind of hanging out, whether they're using that raised ice ridge um, as some wind protection, uh, it got a little windy in the Weddell Sea from time to time, or just hanging out. They liked a, a better view. Um, not quite sure, but it was very, very exciting to see the Adelie penguins. Um, I'm going to switch over to a video that I have um, of the ship as it's breaking ice, passing an Adelie penguin colony. I think. So I'm not sure how well you can see um, the Delhi penguins um, there, but the sound, the scraping sound you hear is the S.A. Agalis II breaking through the sea ice. And I can guarantee you that these Adelie penguins have never seen a person or have never seen a ship um, like the S.A. Agalis II, especially so close to their home. So um, they don't really want anything to do with us. Um, in fact, right after the, the ship goes by, you know, everything freezes up freezed up right behind us, froze up right behind us, uh, and the penguins sort of went back to life as usual. So um, they, this was probably a very big event in their life to see this monster red ship sail by them, but it was really funny to me to see how sort of awkward they are on land because they, they move, they have tiny little feet, and they waddle a lot, and sometimes when they're trying really hard to run, they slide on their bellies a little bit, um, but that doesn't seem to move them along too much faster. Um, they were really, really fun to observe and, and provided some good laughs um, as, as we watched them. But of course, as part of all of this, and this applies to all of the animals I'm going to show you today, we gave them lots and lots of space. Um, we didn't try to touch the Adelie penguins. We didn't go too close to the Adelie penguins. Uh, we tried to sort of leave them alone and let them continue to live their lives as we went about the search. Yeah, and that and that actually is a is a question that I that we I see in the chat that maybe Tim you can touch on a little bit more. Um, and just just for everyone's knowledge, I I know that 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 video was a little bit um uh a little bit less smooth than than sometimes you've seen in other videos that we've shared before. Uh, we apologize for that. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty just to get the um to to get these videos up and going. Um, but but. Please, please know that you'll be able to go on on reachtheworld.org and watch these videos. Um, if not right away, then very, very soon. And, and you can always go to reachtheworld.org um, and check out all of the amazing content we have on the Endurance 22 page um, to be able to, to access these just incredible photos and videos and so much more. Um, but the, we do have a question from our friends in Brazil that um, asking about, is it true that touching penguins and other animals is prohibited in places like Antarctica and South Georgia? Uh, and I know it's a little more complex than just it's prohibited, right? Yeah, I mean, it, as part of our, our license to go and do this expedition, we agreed and everyone agreed that um, we would stay away uh, from the wildlife, leave the wildlife as untouched and, you know, happy and natural as, as possible. Um, in some cases, as you'll see later on, um, the, the wildlife was very interested in us. Um, so if we, for example, an ice team was working on the ice, it was fairly common for some emperor penguins to come walking over and just get really close and investigate what they were doing. At no point did anybody touch them or pet them or feed them or do anything uh, that you would associate with, with a team animal. They're still wild animals um, in their natural habitat, and that's how we really want them to stay. Um, but if the animals showed curiosity in us, which, which a few of them did, we could just sort of sit and let them walk around us, um, but we did not touch them uh, in any way, no. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's really important that everyone knows and everyone remembers that 
places like Antarctica and even places that are probably pretty close to, to those of your backyards, whether you're in Brooklyn or France or Connecticut or New Jersey or California, Oregon, where all these different people are joining us today, um, that, that when you're dealing with wild animals, that you have to be make sure you show them a healthy sense of respect. And you have to remember that as cute and adorable and as much as you want to maybe pet one of these things, they are still wild animals. And so we have to make sure that we are respectful of them in their space. Uh, and so we want to take lots of good pictures and, and be able to share these amazing stories. But still remember, they, they are not pets. They are not. This is not a zoo. We are we are often wild spaces. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's um, let's dive back into the Adelie penguin pictures because I have uh, a lot more to get through today. Um, the next picture you can see a close up from uh, one of my new friends from the expedition. Fred, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful photos with us today. Um, this is a picture of a Delhi penguin um, looking at us as we were looking at it. Um, just as curious uh, to, to know who we were as we were to know uh, more about it. Uh, just a beautiful picture. You can see a little bit of snow on its face. Just the cutest. The Delhi penguins were very, very cute. Um, and let's go to the next one. You can see another. Uh, Photo from another expedition friend, Biat. Thank you so much, Biat, for sharing these photos. Tim, um, Tim just yes. really quick on the on the last photo that you put up. Um, actually, I believe we have the photographer uh, who took that watching us um, from Toulon, France. So excellent, um, Fred. Great to have you here. <laughs> Beautiful photos. Um, <laughs> Bonjour, excellent. merci, Fred. <laughs> excellent. Yes. Um, I, I, the, there were many, many more talented wildlife photographers on the expedition than me. And I'm very grateful for those uh, who are willing to share their photos uh, with us so we could really get a good sense of the amazing wildlife of the Weddell Sea. This is an Adelie penguin on top of one of those ice ridges. Um, you can see it's got its beak open, maybe calling for a friend, making some noise. I have a good example of some emperor penguins uh, and the sounds that they make a little later. Um, so we can, uh, move on to the next one. As you can see, the Adelie penguins often were with groups of other Adelie penguins. They were in the sort of larger groups than emperor penguins were. Um, this is a group that had found a pretty nice spot next to uh, an ice ridge and were just enjoying some sunshine. Um, we'll get a close up in, in, on the next picture of, of one of the penguins in this colony. Um, but you can kind of see they, they look a little fuzzy and a little scruffy. Uh, many of the Adelie penguins were doing what's called molting at this time. So they were shedding a, a layer of their feathers in favor of the next, uh, the next sort of thicker coat of feathers. Um, so it kind of looked like they were having a bad hair day sometimes. <laughs> they looked uh, maybe like they had just woken up. Um, but this one I thought was really cute. And I, this picture is one of my favorites because it gives you a sense of the incredibly harsh environment that these adorable Adelie penguins uh, survive in uh, year after year after year. I mean, that is exactly the landscape that they have to navigate with their tiny feet. Um, they are obviously um, eating from underneath the ice. They are um, eating the krill and they're eating um, some of the things that live beneath the ice. And the Adelie penguins are much better swimmers than they are on land. But the ones we could see the most were, were on, and when I say land, I mean ice, because this is on top of water. But they're, they're a little awkward on the ice, but they're very, very good swimmers uh, and very graceful, actually, once they get into the water and start to hunt for their food. Tim, I uh, Tim, I know you you don't have necessarily pictures of them swimming underwater because that's its its own thing. Uh, but I highly recommend that those of you who are watching out there uh, make sure to look at um, watch some videos on on YouTube or whatever of um, penguins swimming underwater. I, I think we have to remember penguins are not birds that can fly. They are they are one of the few birds that cannot fly. But when you watch them swim underwater, it looks like they're flying underwater. They have mm -hmm. um, they have adapted. They have evolved to be able to fly and just a slightly different way, uh, which is pretty amazing to, to do that. Before we go on, I know, Tim, you have a ton of pictures, and I and I hate to take away from that, but I want us to start bringing on some classrooms, because I know a couple of our classrooms may have to leave a little bit early. So um, maybe if we could see if there's any students um, from Miss, uh, from our uh, from Northside, uh, second grade classroom in St. Louis, um, 
if there's any students who have a, has a question for Tim about what we've talked about so far. Hey, Northside. Don't think we can hear you. Um, hey, Northside, I don't think we can hear you. Maybe maybe there something might be muted. I, I see you have an amazing basket of goodies, though. Yep. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, no, we still can't hear you. So um, so while you're figuring that out, we'll 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 drop you backstage really quickly, um, and and just make sure that. But but let's maybe go to um, let's go to Brooklyn to um, to uh, PS One, the School of Leadership and Creativity, and see if there's any students there who has a question. Great. Go ahead, Elisha. So my question is. My name is. Honey. My name is Elisha. My question is, how do I feel to take the pictures of the of the penguins of the daily penguins? Yeah, great question. I think it was Elisha. Thank you so much for your question. I think I, what I heard was, um, how did it feel to take these pictures? Yes, that was the question. Yeah, thank you for that great question. I, like I said, I'm not like the world's best photographer, but being in this really unique place where the um, where the wildlife of the Weddell Sea uh, was a little bit more accessible than wildlife is elsewhere, just because of the unique place we were. I don't think I needed very many special skills to take the photos. In many cases, as you'll see later on, the emperor penguins walked right up to me, which, you know, all you have to do is take your picture your camera up and and push it. And in some cases, I even didn't want to take photos because the experience of sitting on the ice and having penguins walk around me or being on the back deck of the ship and seeing whales surface was so memorable and so unique and so moving that I didn't want to mess with my camera. I just wanted to remember it as best I could in my mind. Um, so I'm grateful for, we had a community of people on the ship who really love wildlife. And when somebody got a good picture, they shared it with the rest of us uh, who didn't have their camera ready in time. Um, so it was a really nice culture of sharing those photos. So some of us could sort of experience it um, and people with good cameras or in the right position could get a nice photo. And then we all had photo records uh, of some of those really wonderful experiences. Great question, though. I love that question. Um, let's let's go let's go to Connecticut and see if uh, anyone from Miss Lemieux's class in, uh, has, a, has a question. Hello, my name is Weston. And my question is, how far did you guys travel for and how long did you travel? Yeah. Hey, Weston. Good question. Um, it's it's a long way is the short answer. The the more correct answer is from Cape Town to the Weddell Sea was more than 3000 nautical miles, um, which is a long, long way. It took us eight, nine, ten days to get there from Cape Town. Um, we stayed more or less in the same place as we are searching for the ship in uh, the Weddell Sea. Uh, just moved around the ship just a little bit to reposition in the area where we were searching for the ship. And then we did, we went to South Georgia Island and back to uh, Cape Town. So another 3,000 or more nautical miles on the way back. Uh, that plus my flights from Chicago to New York to Cape Town, uh, I would say at, at a minimum, I traveled nine, ten thousand 10,000 miles uh, over the course of this journey, which is more or less like crossing the United States from coast to coast three or four times at least. That's a really far. <laughs> there, were, there were days when it felt really, really far. <laughs> yeah, great question. And it's a, it's a question that I think is really important for us to do. And, and maybe we can have some of our students who are watching us live or who will be watching us in the future to maybe map that out for Tim and be able to get exactly how many miles did Tim travel. If he started in Chicago, he stopped over in New York and then flew directly from New York to Cape Town. And then and then we have, we have we've shown plenty of things exactly where he went to in the Weddell Sea and then back. And then for us to see exactly how many miles did Tim travel 
Um, it's a it's it's a lot of miles in a in a relatively short amount of time, but still pretty incredible. Um, so thank you so much, Connecticut. We're gonna go back to St. Louis and see if if uh, if those um, if if maybe they're they're small. Oh, I think I can hear you now. Hi. Hi. My name is Aaliyah, and I'm from Northside Community School, and we have these stuffed animals in our classroom, and I was wondering, um, did Sealy see some of um the some of these animals out of this basket in the Weddell Sea? Ooh, will you show me what you have? So, this is a dugong, and we have been like learning about this for a while. And it's like they um live in the sea, but we did not we did not see one of those in the Weddell Sea. No. Did you see a dolphin? No, we didn't see a dolphin. I saw some whales, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but we didn't see any dolphins. Have you seen a blue whale? Mm, I, the, I saw the whale that was just a little bit smaller than a blue whale, a fin whale. Um, and I'm, there may have been blue whales in the water, but I didn't see them. Can I tell you something, Tim? Yes, of course you can. I have been working on a Sealy story in my um journal, and I was me and Miss Turney was discussing if we were like going to um put it in like one of our um books, you and know, like we were going to we were going to show you the book and like take a picture of it so you can see it. I would love that, and you know who else loves that. Celie loves that. You, can, you can't tell, but Celie is very excited. <laughs> and and we love being able to hear stories from from students just like you and your classmates. We love being able to hear the stories that you come up with. We saw some um, just on that same topic. We actually saw some incredible um, artwork this morning from I believe it was actually Miss Mesk's class uh, at PS One, the School of Leadership and Creativity, um, where they where they uh, a student was able to to, to capture what Celie announcing to Tim. That, that the endurance had been found and tell and being able to write out a story like that. We love being able to hear stuff like that. So please, this is an open invitation to not only you who are on the screen right now, but everyone out there, please send us that stuff. I love it. Tim loves it. Celie loves it. Everyone here at Reach the World loves it. Aliyah, I can't wait to read your story. Thank you so much for your great questions. All right, let's see some more animals, Tim. Yeah, yeah, let's go. We're um, we're ready for a new category of penguin. Um, in fact, I wrote down fun fact about penguins. There are many. There are eight species of penguins in the Antarctic. I saw three of them. Um, we have talked about the Adelie penguins, and here's a great picture from Fred. Um, in, in the foreground, in the front, in an adorable Adelie penguin. And in the back, you can see some of those scruffy Adelie penguins that are molting. They look like they're just having a really rough day. <laughs> but it's a natural process of, of uh, getting a thicker uh, and uh, better coat, which will help keep them warm in this uh, cold climate. So on to the next category of penguins. These are emperor penguins. And I actually saw these penguins as we were breaking ice, as we were moving through the Weddell Sea. And I love this picture because to me, it looks like uh, two parent emperor penguins and one baby emperor penguin that's just getting yelled at or is being told to, like, to get out of the way of this big red ship that's coming through. Um, I really, really like the, the story that this picture tells. But this was our first sighting or my first sighting of emperor penguins. And little did I know that over the course of the few weeks to follow, we would see emperor penguins everywhere. You can tell they're emperor penguins by the way they stand up nice and tall. They're a little bit taller than the Adelie penguins. And they have that beautiful sort of yellowish orange color uh, on their necks. 
Um, and we're gonna, we can just keep moving. And there's a lot more pictures of, of these wonderful penguins. Emperor penguins waddle in a funny way, just like the Adelie penguins, but they also like to slide on their very like jolly round bellies. They kind of plop down in a way that's really fun to watch. And they use their, their feet in the back and their, their flippers on the side and just kind of slide like they're sledding across the surface of the sea ice. Um, let's go on to the next picture, please. All right, nice picture from Biat. You can see some of the really beautiful uh, patterns on this emperor penguin's uh, fur or on its feathers, uh, some of the beautiful color on the side of the emperor penguin's head. And you can see that one on the right is really checking out Biat, who took this photo, uh, wondering who in the world these people are who came out of nowhere um, and are taking pictures of them. And the next picture, you can see uh, two members of the science team. I think that's Mira and Jakob, who are doing a, a survey of the sea ice thickness. And I told you before that the emperor penguins were especially curious. As soon as we got down to the ice, or as soon as we, um, we stopped the S.A. Gallus II to do some underwater surveying, um, the emperor penguins would come to us. They would, they would come right up next to the ship. They would um, make some really funny sounds, which I'll share a, a short video with of you with, uh, of them with in just a moment. Um, and they were just super, super curious. Um, they were many people on the ship's favorite penguins because they were so personable and because we got to, to get a really good look at them. In the next picture, you can see sort of the path of an emperor penguin who came a long way to see the ship uh, when we had stopped to, to put the AUV down and look for the endurance. Um, as the emperor penguins moved around that I saw a little bit more than the Adelie penguins who like to stay on their, their perches. Um, and it was really, really fun to see them move on the ice. You could see them very well from some of the outdoor observation areas on the ship, like the helipad in the back. I love this picture because look at look at the footprints on uh, that you have. So you have like at the top those the, you can tell that the penguin just was shifting along on its belly, and then it couldn't couldn't get any farther, so it had to stand up and then waddle its way all the way through. I, th I think it's it's a really good example. You can act, you can see exactly what that penguin was doing, and and also how how short and stubby its legs are. And but it was it was clearly really excited to be able to see what the heck that big red ship were and those those weird looking penguins that kept stepping off of it. One of the, that's absolutely true. And one of the funniest things to watch was an emperor penguin who had been sliding on its belly, returning to a standing position. Like it doesn't have arms, right? It doesn't have fingers. Uh, it is just has tiny feet. Like I, I can't, I watched it many, many times and I still can't describe to you how an emperor penguin goes from laying on its belly to standing up. It kind of like tilts back. I, I, I looked at it and watched it for a long time to try to explain it to people who didn't see it and I still can't explain it, but they do regularly get from their belly back up to their feet. It's a really funny thing to watch. All right, um, here's a good example. I was explaining before how if we got on the ice and we sat still, um, the emperor penguins would come up to us and we didn't go, we certainly would never have gone this close to emperor penguins. We would not have walked up to a group of emperor penguins like this, but this is Carl and Carl was lying down on the, on the snow and the ice, just hanging out, enjoying the scenery. And these emperor penguins came over to take a closer look at him, which was made for a really neat moment. Um, as we've discussed in past live streams, the sea ice in the Weddell Sea is very dynamic. It's always moving and crashing and bumping together to form these pressure ridges. And you can see this um, emperor penguin has arrived at a newly formed pressure ridge. And with those little feet um, and their sort of limited ability to move on, on solid land or on this ice surface, you can imagine that that may look kind of like a mountain to an emperor penguin who is, is trying to get by. Um, I didn't see which route this emperor penguin took uh, but they they find a way to get around these things uh, and are living in abundance in the Weddell Sea, and it's really fun to see. Um, on the next picture, you can see emperor penguins who are entering the water right behind the S.A. Gallus II. Uh, and as soon as they slide off that ice, 
into the water. It's like they're a whole different animal. Um, in fact, it's really hard to see them moving underwater because they're like a rocket. What was so slow and kind of funny to watch on the ice becomes just like uh, like watching an underwater missile move through the water. They Their movement and their ability to move changes completely. And I'm gonna, I have a video of some emperor penguins that were swimming behind the ship. And I want you to watch for these sort of like streaks of uh, bubbles that come out from underneath the ice. Uh, and those are emperor penguins moving underwater. All right. Well, I hope you've had a chance to sort of see those emperor penguins move. It, they make it look so easy. In contrast to how they move on land, they make swimming in the water look so, so easy. And that's probably the main reason why they have these big full bellies full of krill and small fish. Um, they look like they, uh, they have plenty of access to food and they're very, very jolly creatures. All right, so if we go back to uh, the, the pictures, one of my final pictures of emperor penguins are of a, a very common scene from the back of the ship. This is the back corner of the SA Gulls 2, the aft deck where the subsea team was searching for um, the, the endurance. And this is an emperor penguin that walked right up to the edge of the ice uh, and was making some calls um, to either its friends or us. It was hard to tell. Uh, and um, the you can see members of the SA Gulls crew. You can see uh, members of the subsea team just pausing from their work for a moment to see this really beautiful penguin uh, up close doing its call. And I have a short video. Hopefully the, the audio will work so you can hear the sound that this emperor penguin was making. All right, well, I heard a couple calls in there. And like Chris said, we'll share this video uh, at reachtheworld.org so you can see it in, um, if it's not coming through very well for you. Um, that The sound of the emperor penguin doing its call was a pretty common uh, occurrence in the Weddell Sea. I wanted to start with penguins because everybody loves penguins, but there are a lot more other creatures uh, to talk about too. Tim, before we get off of penguins, I, I do know that um, at least one of our classrooms is going to have to 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 duck out soon. So I wanted to make sure to bring them in at least one more time. Um, so if we can, if we if we have any any other students at um, at Northside in St. Louis who want to ask a question, and then we'll we'll do the same for our friends in Connecticut and our friends in Brooklyn. Um, there's also a couple of questions in the chat that I'll get to as well. So keep those questions coming. So great. Hi, my name is Simone, and my name is Simone Smith, and my question is, do different kind of penguins make different kind of noises? Hey, Simone, what a great, great question. I, um, I heard, as we just heard, I heard a lot of emperor penguin noises. Um, I don't recall offhand um, the Adelie penguin noises. Um, as being as as loud or as memorable as the emperor penguin noises. I'm sure they do make noises, but in my experience, uh, I don't I didn't hear them or I don't remember them as well as the emperor penguin noises. So 
Uh, I assume that they make different noises and that those noises are used to communicate amongst their friends and to others about uh, danger that might be in the area. Um, but I can't really speak that well to that question. That might be a good one uh, for us to ask a marine biologist. And I would, I would also say too, it's a great question, but remember that penguins are birds. So they're, they're not that far, they're, they're, they're distantly related to the birds that you'll see in and around St. Louis, whether they're, whether they're, they're pigeons or cardinals or, or, or woodpeckers, or I'm, I'm not actually sure what kind of birds you guys have there, but think about the birds that you, that you see often, think about the calls that they have. Each different type of bird has its own special calls and some of them are really loud and some of them are really soft. And so, um, and so, all birds have that that those really unique, different ways to that that they can communicate with one another. Um, so let's go to uh, Miss Lemieux's class in Connecticut and see if they have any questions for us. No, he does not. Is it fascinating to see all those animals? Yeah, good question. Um, I loved it. I really was not expecting to see as much wildlife as I saw. And I wasn't really prepared for how magical it is to see such a wide variety of animals living in their natural habitat. The Weddell Sea is one of the few places left in the world that really just never sees humans. Humans don't go there. It's too hard to get there. Uh, it's too remote. It's too harsh. Unless we were looking for the, the rep, wreck of endurance, I'm not sure we would have had any reason to go there um, or we we're doing science, you know. So it was, it was incredible. I felt very, very lucky to be in a place that not very many people get to go to and to see animals that don't ever get to see humans and to get to be the human that they see. And by that, I mean, not touch them, not bother them, like let them continue to live around me uh, for the brief time we were together and just observe them in their natural habitat. It was magical. Yeah, great question. Well, let's go. Let's go to Brooklyn. Let's go to PS One uh, and see if see if there's anyone there that has a question for Tim. Say, my name is Joshua. My name is Joshua, and I have two questions. My first question is: um, Do different kind of um, penguin breeds um, eat they meet a different one? Like, um, will they fight, or will they act like, or will they act like another? That was a lot. I'm just going to repeat Joshua's question. Joshua would like to know if the two different kinds of penguins that you saw, if they came across each other, would they fight? Mm -hmm. And he would like to know if there are were polar bears. Mm -hmm. Great questions, Joshua. Thank you so much. I did not see Adelie penguins and uh, emperor penguins hanging out very much. They were definitely in the same general area. There could be both types of penguin on one big ice floe, but they did not like meet up and talk and hang out. I don't think that they would fight each other if they did come across each other. They would just sort of go on their way. They they like to hang out with the type the same type of penguin. Um, so no, I don't think that they would fight each other. Um, it's a really good question too about polar bears because a lot of people think polar bears live wherever it's really cold, right? But the truth is that polar bears only live in the Arctic or the way way top of our Earth, um, closer to the North Pole. Uh, there are no polar bears at all in in the Antarctic. And so I wanted I wanted to 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 point out two things. Number one, remember that Tim showed us some pictures of of penguins that were in groups and he called them a colony, right? So pe penguins are a type of animal that live in it's not just one or two and they live on their own like some other animals do. They live in big groups. And so that means you have one big group of animals that all need to to eat there's a great picture of it that that they all have the same, they all eat the same type of food. And so, and so uh, the one, one reason why you probably emperor penguins and, and Adelie penguins were trying to separate from each other is that 
if they're both going after similar groups of food, similar types of fish, they need to be far enough away so that way they can, everyone can in each colony can have enough to eat. And, and so that's something that's called competition. Uh, and so I, that's something that I want you guys to maybe think about is, is you know, if, 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 everyone, if everyone only had one grocery store to go to, that there wouldn't be enough food for everyone because there, everyone would be buying up everything before they could restock the shelves. And so, so different groups of animals like penguins, they need to make sure that they're separated enough from each other. Uh, but it's a great question. And so we have some other really fantastic questions in the chat that I want to get to. So we have another group of students from PS1 that asked, what was your favorite animal to see, Tim? Mm. Um, and if, gonna, you haven't, if we haven't seen it yet, then we'll, we'll hold off on that one. We're going to get to it. I'll, okay. show you my, I'll show you my favorite. Great. And um, also, I see in the chat that um, we have a penguin expert weighing in and confirming that each species of penguin makes its own um, different sounding noise. Uh, so there you go. So I would, I would again, let, let's make sure that we, we use our, we work with our teachers and look up each, the, each of the different types of calls. Yeah. Um, I think that could be a fun activity for you all to do. Um, we also have uh, a student from, uh, named Wendy who wants to know, how do penguins swim so fast? I, I can't, just by observing uh, the way they move, I can't explain how they move so fast. I, would, I expect them to be good swimmers because I know they depend on being good swimmers to get their food. Um, but at one point I was looking off of the helideck into the water beneath the back of the ship and I saw just this like bolt of white go across the water and it moved so fast it never crossed my mind it was a penguin. And it wasn't until the penguin rocketed out of the water and back onto the ice that I could confirm that it was a penguin that had made that, that path under the water. Um, they move incredibly fast, just very aerodynamic or hydrodynamic. The water sort of, they slide through the water really easily. Um, how they move so fast though is probably a, a much more complicated question that I don't fully understand. Well, remember that I just, I, to all you students out there who are wondering about that, remember that I mentioned that penguins have evolved to fly under the water, that they're really awkward on land, but they're, they're flippers, um, their feet, they're not really good, but, uh, but on land, but then they jump into the water and that's where they've, they, they have evolved over millions of years to, um, to be able to be really, really fast. So uh, if any of you have ever had to put on flippers to jump in the pool or, in, or into the ocean, if you're near one, it's really hard to walk around on land with those. But as soon as you get in the water, zoom, it's very, very similar for mm -hmm. penguins. So keep these questions coming. They're absolutely fantastic. But I, I want to see some more, some more uh, animal pictures, personally. Yeah. Let's move on to a, a new category of creature. Um, many of you will recognize this one. It's helpfully labeled for you. This is a crab eater seal. And contrary to its name, it does not eat crabs. Uh, maybe someone can explain to me how it got its name, but it's definitely misleading. It eats krill and the fish uh, in the water, which there's plenty of in the Weddell Sea. Um, the crab eater seals are like the puppies of the Weddell Sea. If you've ever seen a puppy just kind of flounder around and roll around and play and wrestle and just be kind of goofy, the crab eater seals do that on the ice uh, all around the Weddell Sea. Um, if you flip to the next picture, you can see one a little bit closer. Um, they, I think they're really cute. Um, they're very, very large. Um, they have these big kind of puppy eyes and, and whiskers. If you look at this one in the face, you can see why I might sort of mistake it for a puppy. But when you see it sort of blundering around on the ice and playing and just napping and, and living its everyday life on the sea ice, uh, you'll especially see why uh, I think of them and many other people did on the ship as well. Think of them as the puppies of the Weddell Sea. Um, and on the next picture you can see, of course, just like the penguins, the, the crab eater seals move into the water um, when it's time to hunt uh, for fish or krill or, or dinner generally. And they, again, are very, very elegant uh, swimmers. They move very fast. Um, they're very playful. You can see some of the thick ice that the, the icebreaker had to break through in order to get to where we were in the Weddell Sea. And the, the seals, especially the crab eater seals, move about on this ice with lots of ease. Um, 
It was very common to see just one crab eater seal by itself, but if we switch to the next picture, there's a great uh, photo from Fred of a bunch of crab eater seals hanging out on the ice together. Um, in some cases, um, the crab eater seals would swim around the, the Essaigalus S too. I know in 2019, the crab eater seals swam up underneath the ship into what's called the moon pool, which is an opening in the bottom of the ship. I didn't see that this time around. Um, but the crab eater seals are very curious. Um, they tended to stay away from us when we went on the ice. Um, we didn't see them, you know, it, when the crab eater seals were sleeping, we could sort of like come to 40 or 50 feet away from them and, and get a, a decent look, but we wouldn't go any closer than that. We just kind of left them alone and observed them from a distance. And the next picture, you can see a crab eater seal playing in the water. Um, they really, really seem to be doing well in the Weddell Sea. In the Weddell Sea, uh, really, really fun animals to watch. And uh, on the next picture, you can see as we were ice breaking one day, there were a whole bunch of crab eater seals swimming in the open water around us. So just another aspect of of the wildlife of the Weddell Sea, or the the part of the Weddell Sea where I was. Uh, as part of this expedition. Now there's one other seal that I saw that I really am excited to show and it's on the next picture. I only have one picture of it because we only saw one. And almost all seals like fish and krill and um, are not really that menacing, but this is a leopard seal and we felt really, really lucky to see this leopard seal. It was a huge seal. It was bigger than any of the other um, uh, crab eater seals that we saw. And one day when we were standing on the, the helideck looking out, this crab eater seal was on its own ice floe uh, right behind the ship. And on either side, off in the distance, there were penguin colonies. And um, leopard seals love a good penguin snack. So you could tell that the penguins were on high alert. They knew that a predator was in the area. And we didn't see the leopard seal go after any of the penguins. But this leopard seal would have absolutely eaten a penguin. And by the looks of its belly, it had had a few uh, in the years prior, leading up to when we saw it. It was a very, very large um, seal, and it's a natural predator of penguins in the area. Tim, I'm starting to see some questions coming through in chat, of, um, which which I, 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 will not, I will not ask you because I, I am pretty sure I, I have to say I, I do not think that you know the answer. Uh, but we're getting a lot of questions from from Genevieve, um, uh, and um, uh, well, Genevieve wants to know what exactly your job was on the expedition. We'll leave that a little till a little bit later because uh, that's a good question. But um, another group of students um, from Miss Germain um, wanted to know it, what's faster, a seal or a penguin. And then Raina wanted to know how many miles an hour do penguins and crab eater seals move, mm -hmm. um, and. Those are excellent questions, and I encourage you students and your teachers to do that research on your own because neither Tim nor I are marine biologists. We are not experts. Um, we really love learning about this stuff just like you do. I'm actually studying it right now. Um, I'm going to class at night specifically to learn more about things that live in our oceans, but I don't even know that yet. So this is a chance for you all to learn as a classroom and to figure that out, but when you find out, tell us because I want to know. Absolutely. Yeah. I, all I can say is from my experience, they move very fast and well under the water. And when you should be able to find a number, uh, if you want to find a number for how fast they move uh, pretty easily. Um, I know we're, we're sort of running short on time. I want to get to this next animal because one of the students asked what my favorite thing was, and it's probably this next one. You can see behind the ship in this beautiful picture by Fred, some of the open water that we kept open so that we could operate the marine robotics uh, as part of the search for endurance. And in some places of the Weddell Sea, there weren't a lot of open patches of water. So if we were in one of those places and you stood on the helideck at the back of the ship for long enough, it was probably likely that you were gonna see a minke whale come up and breathe in the open water right behind the ship. And this is a beautiful picture of a minke whale that was coming up from a dive and had a good sense that there was open water that it could breathe in. And if you wanna just keep moving through the photos, we'll get a chance to see this whale as it surfaces. 
um, in the surface of the water. There it is. You can see its whole body swimming uh, in the super clear, very clean water of the Weddell Sea. It was really easy to see the whales swimming just beneath the surface. Um, and in the next picture, you'll be able to see the, the front end of the whale really well. Absolutely magnificent creatures, beautiful creatures. We saw quite a few of them um, over the course of our time in the Weddell Sea. I know that a minke whale is not the only type of whale that lives in uh, the Weddell Sea, that the Weddell Sea is a, a common place for whales to come and have their babies. Um, but it was minke whales that we saw the most of while we were in the Weddell Sea and we got the closest to because we were the ones creating those air pockets that they could then use to breathe. And it was absolutely beautiful to see them. I have only on a few occasions been that close to whales in my life. And I love whales. They're so uh, massive, but gentle uh, and kind of mysterious because we, after we saw them for a brief moment, they would do a deep dive and just disappear underneath that ice and go off into the distance again. Um, all right. Well, if we're going to keep moving, I have three more pictures, four more pictures, and then we'll do a final round of questions. So you all know I had Sealy in the Weddell Sea. Um, this on the top left is Samson. He was the mascot for the subsea team. Samson was named after Ernest Shackleton's largest and favorite dog from the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So Samson and Sealy became friends over the course of our time in the Weddell Sea. And this is a picture of them playing on the ice uh, right above the spot actually where we found the endurance about 10,000 feet beneath the ice. So uh, one of the students asked if Seeley got to see some of this wildlife. I took Seeley everywhere I went, especially when I went out on the ice and Seeley loved uh, getting a chance to meet some of the other living things, other creatures that lived in the Weddell Sea. So my final two pictures are not wildlife, but two really interesting uh, natural phenomenon that we witnessed while we were in the Weddell Sea. This is called a parhelion, or also known as a sun dog. And because there are ice crystals in the air when it's really cold um, in the Weddell Sea, sometimes you get this really cool circle or halo around the sun. It created this perfect circle on one or two days we saw that we were lucky enough to see a sun dog uh, that um, there was enough uh, uh, crystals, enough ice crystals in the air to reflect or refract the light coming from the sun and create this really cool circle of light uh, around the sun. And the next one is something I didn't even know existed until I went to the Weddell Sea. This was right at sunset one evening. Uh, it's called a sun pillar. Um, and the sun, as it was setting um, right below the horizon there, Again, the, the ice crystals in the, in the air reflected and changed the way the light was moving through the sky above the setting sun. And it created just this beam or this column of light that went straight up from where the sun was setting. And it was really beautiful. Again, never knew that existed. Uh, thank you to Saunders for this beautiful picture. And now it makes me want to learn what other sort of cool special effects you can see uh, with the sun under certain uh, circumstances around the world. Uh, so that, as far as my uh, the wildlife that I saw in the Weddell Sea, um, that was the bulk of it. Um, we'll be sharing a lot more pictures of my wildlife as I go through them uh, and sort through some of the pictures that other expedition members have shared with me. But those were my some of my favorite moments and I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Amazing. Um, so first, first things first, let's bring back um, our students at PS1 in Brooklyn, see if, see if any students there have, have a question for you. Then we'll go to Connecticut. Unfortunately, uh, our, our friends in St. Louis had to go to art class. Um, so, um, but, but let's, let's, see what our, let's see what our friends in Brooklyn have to say. Um, my name is Joshua. My question is, do you saw any of the animals there um, eating thing? And um, like, did they, um, how did they act? Like, did they mostly like um, kept going in the water and kept coming out mm -hmm. like a slide? Yeah. 
That's a really great question, Joshua. And it bring, gives me a chance to talk about one thing that lives underwater that's really important to all the wildlife that I talked about today. There's something called krill. It's like little shrimp kind of that live in abundance in the Weddell Sea. They're, it's all over the place. It's like a buffet of krill beneath the surface of the ice. And that is what the penguins um, and the fish and many of the other things that live there um, eat. And it forms the basis for a whole food chain. So when a uh, penguin goes into the water, they can basically don't have to swim very far, don't have to work very hard to get all the food that they want, and they pop back out on the ice. And I didn't see anybody eating, but I could tell by the size of their bellies that they had no shortage of food. They have very round, jolly bellies, just like I do after I eat a big meal. Like they looked as happy as could be uh, and very, very well fed. So there's a there's a question in the chat from Eliza um, who wanted to know why is it that penguins can't fly and and I, I do want to just have us give a very simple explanation um, to that and because it's it, it I think it fits in with what Tim said so when one of those first pictures that we that Tim shared with us we saw what it looked like above above uh, the ice that it was there didn't seem like there was a lot there it was snow it was cold and that was it um, but below the ice in the in the ocean, there's krill, there's small fish that feed on the krill, all these different things that, that, that birds and other wildlife like the seals can eat. And so, and so over time, um, penguins evolved to be able to, to swim better and better because they didn't need to fly as much. They were, it was more important for them to swim. And so, and so penguins, uh, penguins a long time ago, lost the ability to fly so that way they could swim a lot better. That's a really, really simple answer, but it's called adaptation and evolution. Uh, and so those are bigger questions that I hope that you can explore with your teachers as a part of your science classes, because it's really interesting stuff. And there are some fantastic uh, scientists who study only that thing, uh, but it's a really, really interesting way to, way to learn about things. So um, let's go to Ms. Lemieux's class in Connecticut and see if, if there's any students there who have questions for you. Um, hi, I'm Paul and I have two questions. First, um, how long is the, mink, is the minky whale? And also, how cold was it when you were um, traveling? Paul, those are great questions and thank you so much for asking them. Uh, the minke whale is not as big as the fin whale. Remember I showed the fin whale at the beginning and said it was the second biggest whale type in the ocean. Minke whales are much smaller, and I don't have an exact uh, measurement for you, but I know that it's not one of the bigger whales in the ocean. Um, it's still big because it's a whale, but it is not as big as the fin whale. Um, you asked how cold it was in the Weddell Sea. Um, because we were um, there sort of right at the end of summer. It was starting to get colder, kind of colder by the day. We were keeping an eye on the weather, but it averaged, um, there were some days where it was probably just below freezing. So maybe in the, like the 20s, 20s Fahrenheit. Um, and then I think the coldest day that we got to was right around 30 below Celsius, which I think is probably in the 20 to 25 below zero Fahrenheit. So it was cold. Um, it was cold enough on those days where if we broke the ice, uh, it would freeze very quickly after we, we passed through and it was allowed to sort of sit and freeze. Um, but it was not so cold that if we wore the right things, if we wore gloves, two layers of gloves, a warm hat, a good lots of layers of clothing and, and a nice uh, water and windproof parka that um, I was could be outside for a couple hours. And, and many of the people in the expedition did stay outside for a long time on those cold days, just because we had the right things to wear. So I, I um, like I told you guys, I, I'm studying a little bit of this myself because I still want to learn, even though, even though I'm a little bit older than some of you students out there, uh, I still want to learn more. And I looked up the, the lengths of the fin whale and the minke whale while, while Tim was telling you that. So, Fin whales are average about 72 to 79 feet long. Um, so pretty, pretty long, pretty big animals. Minke whales are closer to about 30 feet long. So, so if you want to maybe at um, next time you guys have 
uh, next time you guys have have recess or at dismissal, maybe measure those out. How long 72 to 79 feet is versus 29 feet. Um, that'll give you a sense of about of minke whale to fin whale lengths and how big how big the, these whales are, even with minkies being one of the smaller types of whales. Um, and remember the blue whale, someone had asked about a blue whale. Blue whales can get almost a hundred feet long. They're, they're closer to about 89 feet they average. So even bigger than that. Yeah, fabulous questions. Um, I don't, like I said, I'm not a whale specialist. I just really appreciate and love the way whales look in the ocean. I know that the Antarctic has it historically been a place where people come to hunt whales and that hasn't happened for, for a while, or at least the numbers have been greatly reduced, which has allowed whales to, to breed and live uh, in relative peace lately. And it was very, very exciting for me to see so many whales living so happily and freely in the Weddell Sea area and the Antarctic region. Absolutely. And so um, I know I know we're this is probably one of our longest live streams ever, but I, I see that we still have students that are eager to ask questions. Um, so I want us to, to have um, one. Um, we're going to go back to our two classrooms and we'll have each um, each student ask one more question before we close out because um, we appreciate you being patient with us. So um, let's go to PS1 first. Ice the ship. Hey Johnny, um, your question was whether we had problems with the ice on the ship. Yeah, the ship, the ship is amazing. The ship was designed to break through ice um, and it did its job perfectly. So no, I wouldn't say we had problems with the ice, but we knew that within the next few weeks and probably it's that way now uh, that we're back, it's moving into winter in the Weddell Sea now. What is our summer in North America is winter in Antarctica in the Southern Hemisphere. So the temperatures were about to get a lot colder. There was about to be a lot less sunshine. Um, so the ice was going to get thicker and thicker and thicker and it would eventually get to a point where the S.A. Gullis II would not be able to break the ice and could potentially get stuck. So I would say we got out of the Weddell Sea just in time. We used all of the technology and the, the capability of the ship to make sure that we didn't get in any trouble with the ice. Yeah, and we can see it. We saw just there the picture of the of the the how the ice is and the thickness of the ice and how amazing the ship is. And we can kind of see that on our background um, right here, how amazing the ship is at, and how well designed it was to be able to break through that ice. So let's go to Connecticut, the Miss Lemuse class um, for our final question of today's live stream. So my name is Erebo Daddy, and I have two questions. First, how thick do you think the ice would get? And second, how many layers did you guys wear? Mm, good questions. I know that the, the multi-year ice, I learned this from several of the ice scientists aboard the expedition. I know that some of the ice that's in the Weddell Sea that doesn't melt during the course of the year gets sort of added onto over the course of additional months and it becomes what's called multi-year ice and it can get to be as much as five meters thick. So if I do a quick translation, that's more than 15 feet thick of ice. So it's taller than the ceiling of your classroom, I would guess. Uh, it is way too thick for most of any ships to break through. Um, and that's just very, very thick ice, um, which would be expected from an area that gets so cold. Um, how many layers did I wear? Well, I lay, um, see, I wore like long underwear. I wore like a sweatshirt, um, a long sleeve shirt, um, uh, kind of a fleece jacket, um, a puffy jacket, and then an outer shell. So in some cases I was wearing as many as six or seven layers on my top. And if I got hot, I could take one off. Or if I got cold, I could put another one on. I wore two pairs of gloves, uh, like a glove liner and some outer gloves that were waterproof and windproof. I wore two or three pairs of socks underneath my boots. And I wore probably three pairs of pants on the coldest day 
um, just to keep myself warm. And over the top of those pants, I wore this really cool pair of uh, snow pants um, that came up underneath my, my jacket. So I didn't have that area around my waist where you get kind of cold because air gets in between your jacket and your pants. I didn't have that. It's important. It's most important that he stays warm. So, so even though it probably took him a half an hour to get dressed, it was, it was, that was how he could spend, spend time on the ice and take so many amazing photos. Yep. Um, and all of that, all of that said, as sort of a closing statement, I was having to do all sorts of special things to stay warm enough in the Weddell Sea. And the animals that I saw along the way didn't change anything. They wore what they wore. And they were doing just fine. Their bodies were perfectly adapted for that harsh climate. And it was so cool to see how much better they were at living in the Weddell Sea than I was. Absolutely. And um, Tim, really quick, we, we did have a question early from Tom in Texas, and he wanted to know, would you go back? Absolutely. I'd absolutely go back. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things, especially in terms of wildlife, is I'm aware that I saw three, I think I saw three of the eight species of penguins. Um, and so I did not see Gentoo, Chinstrap, Macaroni, Rockhopper, Magellanic, Penguins. Um, I didn't see many species of whales that I would love to see. Um, there were several species of seals that I didn't get to see. And I know that I need to learn more about the birds of the area too, because the birds have their own whole own story about how they survive and get by in that environment. So there's so much to learn. I would go back in a heartbeat. Uh, and I hope someday to have the chance to do that. Absolutely. Well, um, on that note, I mean, we're still getting some amazing questions and, and please, please keep asking them. And, and if you didn't get your question answered, I encourage you as students, work with your classmates, work with your teacher, come up with the answer, do that research, and then come back to us and tell us the answer. And we'll share it out in one of our upcoming newsletters. Uh, because the the research, the the stories that you're coming up with, the things that you're sharing with us are are some of the some of the most exciting and inspirational things that that Tim and I get to do as a part of Reach the World. Uh, but I do want to extend a, a sincere thank you to you, Tim, and to our classroom. So let's bring both of our classrooms on um, for one last um, one last hurrah. If if uh, all those students. Um, can get on there. We'll unmute you and we'll we'll get nice and loud for one quick second. Oh. Guys, bye. 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 Thank you for your great questions. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tim. And uh, and thank you to everyone out there. Thank you to those of you who will be watching this in the future. It's been such a pleasure to be able to, to take part in this. And um, and Tim, I'll, I'll give you the, the closing, closing statement. Is there anything else you want to say before we close out on this amazing live stream? Such a pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you so much for your questions. The wildlife of the Weddell Sea in the South Atlantic is so surprising and even more wonderful than I could have imagined. I'm just really sharing the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, uh, for the things that, that live and thrive in this area and was just one, one reason why the Weddell Sea is so special.